Good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to start with our traditional opening, which is good morning and welcome to Maximizing Bundles Through Integration, presented jointly by the Alliance for Home Health Quality and Innovation and the Visiting Nurses Association of America. This session is being recorded. The continuing nurse education activity has been approved for one contact hour by the Maryland Nurses Association, an accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. In order to receive your certificate of completion, you will need to attend this program in its entirety and complete the evaluation, which is available in your conference app. Certificates of completion are available at the registration desk. Our faculty has disclosed no financial conflict of interest. A copy of the full disclosure sheets is available on the table outside the room. Um, I'm going to hand this off. And then I, I also wanted to mention, um, uh, in Dee's presentation, she refers to a publication. Um, I will go ahead and see if we can get that added to the conference app as well so that you'll have that available. Um, if not, uh, you can use my contact information um, because I work for VNAA, uh, and I will, I will make sure that it does get to all the attendees so you guys will have it. So um, this is the awkward part where I introduce myself. <laughs> I'm the Vice President of Policy and Innovation for VNAA. Uh, I work with our members and industry thought leaders and providers and Congress to amplify um, and strategically position home-based care in the healthcare arena. Uh, I continue to work with members to implement new healthcare delivery and payment models, um, influenced and enriched by industry trends, best practices, innovative concepts, and lessons learned. Um, in the app is my full bio, and you can see that I'm a typical DC person who's worked for a million associations and on the Hill. So <laughs> with that, uh, I do want to introduce uh, Dee Cornetti. Uh, Dee is a nationally recognized as a speaker in the areas of home care, standardized tests and measures in the field of physical therapy, therapy training, and staff development, including OASIS coding and documentation in home, the home health arena. Dee is the past editor of the quarterly report, a publication of the American Physical Therapy Association's Home Health Section, as well as past inaugural co-chair and member of the Home Health Section's practice and inaugural member of the, its education committees. She most served the Home Health Section as its program chair for annual conference educational activities, combining sections meeting CSM, where she was responsible for securing educational program. Dee is the current president of the American Physical Therapy Association's Home Health Section and has been an active member in good standing in APTA since 1986. Dee serves as the president of the Association of Home Care Coding and Compliance and a member of the Association of Home Care's Coder Advisory Board and Panel of Experts. She has served as a content expert for standard setting for Decision Health Board of Medical Specialty Coding, BSMC, uh, Home Care Coding HCS-D, and OASIS HCS-O credentialed exams. D also serves on as an advisory board member for the home health content with physicaltherapy.com, a therapy CE provider. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Deed so she can do her presentation. There's the opportunity for questions at the end of her section before we roll into mine. So with that. Thanks, Joy, and, and thanks. It's nice to see everybody on the final day. A lot of times I get to be the, the anchor position at a conference, which can, you know, the caboose, which could be good or bad, but I'm going to turn that over to my buddy Tony um, later to, uh, at the final session, so hopefully I'll see you all there as well. Um, if you didn't catch it, I'm a physical therapist, and a lot of times I come into rooms like this, and I feel like I'm at a... At a um, support group. Hi, my name is Dee. I'm a physical therapist. I kind of had to do that recently at the American Occupational Therapy Association conference, but it was pretty well received in Philadelphia, my, my, my home stomping ground. So that's, that's good. Um, so when Joy and I met at the financial conference last fall in Chicago, we had talked about um, uh, doing a presentation related to uh, bundles, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about that. We know that that's where we're going, um, and we're partially there already, even though we don't have all the all the responses and the answers about it yet. Um, but I really want to bring to you a little different perspective 
um, from the role of therapy and what I hear through my professional association because therapy is an integral part, not just physical therapy, but all therapy is an integral part and in offering in home care, okay? And we are striving at this point to practice to the top of our license in this setting. Um, and, and, and I'm hoping that I'll open some eyes or I'll confirm some um, notions or some water cooler gossip about what PTs can and can't do. Um, and uh, be willing to talk to anybody after as um, I decided not to red eye out um, later tonight. So I'll be here uh, through tomorrow. So um, I enjoy these conversations very much. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about um, the, the initiatives. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're hearing and, and, and some of the challenges we're facing and some of the things going on within our professional association, not just the specialty section of the home health uh, section, but also the American Physical Therapy Association, because we're on board with this, this transition. We're on board with not being widget counters. I'm tired of being like Laverne and Shirley, Shlomigo, Shlomago, you know, counting the counting the beer bottles as they go in down they go down the 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 um, the conveyor belt. I'm really tired of that. I don't want to be counted by my Hicks picks. I don't want to be counted by my visits. I don't want to be counted by my minutes. Okay, I want to be counted by how I can help reduce rehospitalization. And I think that there's many of us therapists that, that believe that and, and want to be seen in that light and have the opportunity to practice at that level. So when, when I looked at the initiatives, I wanted to ask, you know, what was the incentive? And we all know that there's a lot of incentives and always comes to bottom line. And I heard a lot about that, um, you know, especially since there's a lot of CFOs here at this conference. Um, and that's a good thing because I think sometimes we don't always talk about the business side of it, but it's a combination. So when I looked at the BPCIs, really it's about can we link payments for all providers in an episode of care, decrease payment, decrease costs while increasing quality. That's really the what's driving it. And for CJR, can we get better and more efficient care, cheaper costs when we're dealing with these very common surgeries that we see. That's really what's driving these initiatives. And so, as we all know, there's favorite bundles and not favorite bundles. The far um, uh, left column is the uh, characteristics, and as you know, most of them are in Model 2 and Model 3. Um, and uh, the majority of the ones in Model 3 are skilled nursing, um, as the participant, but we also are seeing a lot more home care getting involved in, in, in these models, um, and that's exciting for me. I, I'm, I'm really happy about that. Um, model 2, um, a lot of this I pulled off the innovation.cms.gov, which I'm sure all of you know about, but this was looking at the two-year evaluation um, and monitoring report. They came out in August. And really the majority of it around is those things that we can control. We're seeing it with those high, high uh, elective surgeries and those um, chronic disease management, which really we know is where the money is being spent. So um, what are some of the findings that we see in the Model 2? Well, first of all, there's better improvement in two mobility measures versus hospital, hospital counterparts for those that don't participate in this BPCI, in that we see improvement in walk without rest and up and down steps, okay, a, a flight of 12 stairs um, in the uh, participants versus the non-participant counterparts. We see a reduction of an average length of stay with sniff use compared to those that are not participants in a bundle two, okay? We see an overall decline of almost $1,000 as compared to those episodes initiated by non-BPCI hospitals. So there is monies moving in the right direction, the, the thoughts there. And as we know, anything that has to do with Washington that is going to cut money, everybody wants to talk about so or cut costs. Um, Really, the CJR project, which we're going to talk a little bit about, and I know Joy's going to spend a lot of time on, is um, 
almost virtually identical to the Model 2 and the BPCI, okay? And so I'm not going to go over the terms of it. Everybody knows that. Um, but what I really want to talk about is what we know and what we have available to substantiate what we do, what we, and when I say we, I mean home care, but specifically, I feel like I'm representing um, most, if not all, of physical therapy at this point. Um, first of all, we know that we're less expensive um, as compared to SNF, and SNF is on the chopping block, and Chif SNF is on the, um, under the interrogation light with their rug rates, and I'm not adverse to that. Um, uh, because I think that um, first day in post-acute at home, um, we get people back into their normal occurring activities and routines um, rather than waiting 21 days to do it and have them further removed from normal behaviors when they come home. So we have a lot of research and a lot of um, uh, literature that supports um, home care as the first setting and supports physical therapy involvement in home care as the first setting as a reduction of rehospitalization, especially for those individuals that have been defined as frail and have these hospital-acquired de uh, uh, deconditioning that occurs simply from an admission, regardless of reason. And so there's a lot of literature that's coming out of APTA right now that really supports incorporation of therapy regardless of the diagnostic grouping, okay? Um, we're also seeing a lot of similar outcomes for therapy, and one of our members, Chris Chimeni, actually did a, um, um, a um, research uh, several years ago and published it in the Journal of Geriatric Physical Therapy that showed comparable outcomes for patients coming home following knee replacement that came straight from uh, the hospital to, to home care um, versus went through a subacute like a sniff probably more than an ERF. Um, before they came home. And so a lot of it had to do with practice behaviors. And I'm sure as I talk to a lot of you, your practice behaviors are staying current and are cutting edge. I always feel like I preach to the choir, but there's so many in our industry that are still practicing. In fact, I reviewed a chart the other day where the nurse said um, to the patient's spouse who just wanted the the nurse to come once a month to check on them, no, we can't do that. Medicare makes us come six times. Moment of silence. <laughs> no, I didn't kill her. I, I should have. I should have sought her out and killed her, but I didn't. Excuse me. Oh, that's being taped. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, so here's some of this stuff going on right now. Uh, did any of you read this comparative study that came out in the orthopedic nurse? And I have to tell you, I'm not a nurse. I love nurses. Uh, my mom's a nurse. I have aunts that are nurses. Some of my best friends are nurses. But what's up with this survey, this study? Okay, this study basically favored direct referral to outpatient PT following hospitalization. Just to let you know, it's, it got a little bit of buzz. It came out um, uh, it, around the winter time, and um, it was a very, it wasn't the strongest of publishable studies, if, if, if you ask a lot of researchers. Um, and um, there was only a sample size of 109 people in the, in the study. There was only 22 that actually went to home care directly, and they didn't even review the home health client records, so they don't know what their baseline function was. Um, and so there's a lot of literature that actually suggests older adults with lower baseline functioning pre-total joint have greater than 80% odds for hospital readmission and greater than 120% chance of serious complications than their counterparts that don't meet those qualifications. And so we know that typically people that come right home have other chronic comorbidities and problems. And so um, right now, just so you know, we feel it's like our job in, in the American Physical Therapy Association and the home health section to generate a letter to the editor, and that's in the works right now. So. Um, you know, my concern is we're going to find all these reasons why, you know, that was a big fear of skipping right over home care, correct, and going right to these outpatient, these physician-invested practices and not coming to, you know, a controlled post-acute setting. And so when this came out, this, this um, study, you know, it caused a little bit of buzz in our industry, and I just want to let you know we're on it because we don't think, as we dissected the method, the methodology and, and the, the, the psychometric properties and, and the rigor of this study, that it was as strong as it needed to be to draw the conclusions they drew. So if anybody's interested in finding more out about that, 
you can contact me or you can reach out and you can read it yourself. Okay, so really this is where we are. This is what I want to spend the time that I have left talking about, which is we have to change our traditional think related to how we provide care. We have to go from those units of billing to this value add mindset where our service provision and the acuity of the patient is based on the influence, how we can influence outcomes. And so there's big challenges and there's actually a lot of meetings going on right now in the next few months at um, in Alexandria, Virginia, the, um, the home base of um, the American Physical Therapy Association to talk about the role of physical therapy in payment reform and be involved in and be at the table and um, and and work cooperatively with with organizations such as Elevating Home. That's that's what we're we're going to be desirous of, and so um, I'm very excited about that. So. From a lot of the people that we have in our organization, and particularly our section members, specialty and home care, and we, we have Tony here who does it for Bayada, um, and we have several people who are literally uh, bundled directors for their national home care companies that are chief operations officers and senior vice presidents and CEOs of home care that are therapists. And so I've had the opportunity to interact um, with a lot of these people as colleagues, and basically they're, they're saying the same thing, okay? What episode initiators are looking for? They're looking for communication. They're looking for clinical decisioning to avoid readmissions. They're looking for the ability to manage those urgent, urgent issues. Good problem solving. They want fiscally responsible providers. We want to make the decisions that are based on a patient-centered approach to care. It's not about cheapest, and I think we're starting to see that a lot of these, these groups that are looking to develop the partnerships are not necessarily looking for the ones that offer the least number of visits. However, that's a quick way in the current payment model to cut costs, right? Just lose a couple visits, correct? And so we're on the challenge to say, why do we need to make every visit count? Here's the problem that I've seen, and maybe you've seen some changes for, for those of you that actually are speaking in partnerships or representing your organization. A lot of times, the episode initiators don't know what we do. They're really only aware of their practices, but they don't really know about post-acute providers. They don't understand our billing mechanism. They don't understand the number of days and how it impacts total costs. They don't understand um, uh, the, the cost of the organization when adding nursing to cases, especially in CJR cases, where it may not be necessary, and I hope I can make that case for you. They don't understand that lupas may not be the best practice when we're talking about outcomes. And so I feel like this is a great opportunity, not just for physical therapy, but for agencies to gather the research, to gather the data, and to make our case and sing from that single sheet of music about all the things we do and what does that interdisciplinary team makeup look like based on the presentation of the patient. Because it's not always about the discipline, okay? A lot of times it's, it, we can work much more cooperatively and, and it doesn't have to be a nurse and a therapist. It can be a therapist. It really, really can. So the success comes from clinical and financial uh, basis. And, and I, I went to a session yesterday about the smart, smart data, and it was really interesting. Anybody there throwing, I know Paul was, throwing the, I think, ball of yarn around. But really, it's about asking the right questions, OK? We go in there, and a lot of times we get in our silo, and we, I'm going to ask physical therapy questions, or I'm going to ask this, or I don't do starts of care. And you know, honestly, we have to have a very holistic approach when we assess a patient. Um, and there's a lot of things that therapists can and should be doing, so that's really the meat of where we're going. Um, earning partnerships really comes about showing your value. Um, it's what are we going to do to get that person home or make home the most desirable place. I can't agree more than the uh, founding board member from Trinity um, who said um, they'll lie in ho the hospital. Oh, yeah, I can take those meds even though they never had to. Just give them to me in a little plastic cup and I'll throw them down my throat. They will lie to get home, and we know that it's a lot different. Um, we have to be there for that 24-hour admissions. The days of therapists working banker's hours disappeared a long time ago in our agencies. 
And we can't accept that anymore. We are seven days a week, okay, like every other skilled discipline. We can't simply cut visits. That's not what we should be doing, okay? And we have to be able to understand what the data is telling us. Um, AHHQI, the MSA maps, those are great resources um, that they've put out and they talked about at the financial conference. And I've shared that with therapists that work in CJR MSAs and said, you all need to pull these up. You need to know that you have no greater hospital readmissions and you have, no, and you have cheaper costs when you are the first post-acute setting. And you need to be able to speak that language, whether you're in front of the patient or you're in front of the physician okay, or you're the person representing your organization. You need to be, keep that in the front of your mind, okay? It's not just about how many feet a person can walk or are we going to set a goal to get them to the mailbox. That's irrelevant at this point in time and somewhat archaic. So um, it's important that, that we all, and, and, and we're working hard in the section to bring forward, when I say the section, Kind of sounds like the mafia, doesn't it? The section. Um, the home health section to, 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 to bring this information to the practicing clinicians, the front line, your human capital, right? Because the front line determines the bottom line. They need to understand these points. And so membership in professional organization and accessing the resources that are available through the APTA from the experts that are doing this is going to be critical to impacting practice and shifting our behaviors to these payment models that we're working in and we're moving towards every day. We have to be able to share our outcomes. You know, it's amazing. Um, I'll go with Cindy Craft and we'll do talks all over and we'll say, how many of you under, you know, what outcomes are you aware of? What's the first one come to your mind? And when you're sitting with therapists, what do you think the first one is that they say? Improvement in what? Ambulation. But if it's an OT group, they might say bathing. How many of them even know risk for rehospitalization? Because there's your money card, right? How many of them are talking? How many of them even come up with that if you gave them the rest of the day? Right? But that's all we are concerned about. That's, that's what, that makes a huge difference in our partnership, uh, you know, desirability, doesn't it? We have to get this information to our frontline people. They need to understand everything they do needs to be driven to reducing risk, and improving outcomes, regardless of it's the magic walk to the mailbox or it's independent with bathing. We have to be focused on, on value and not visit. So some of the pitfalls that, that um, some of our, um, uh, 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 I don't want to say our initiators, the people that are being approached for partnership in our association are finding is that they're being asked over promise and they realize it forces them to under deliver. Don't do that. If something's going south, get on it quick. Don't try to hide behind it. It could be extremely costly. So communication is essential. And we're seeing that in some of the new COPs, aren't we? Where it's not just a nurse who is who is, um, and I don't say just a nurse, but therapists can be clinical managers. APTA wrote a comment that got accepted and it was adopted in the new COPs that, that all these disciplines can be seen as clinical managers. That's critically important in moving us to the right service at the right time in the right setting for the right patient. Correct? Okay. So, Going back to this point about pitfalls, it's really important. If I can have you leave with anything, make sure that whatever decisioning you're coming up with, provide some of that background, provide some of that education to the frontline staff. You know, they're looking for the person, the directions are wrong, they're dealing with the yapping dog, right? They're dealing with the fact that their computer went blue screen and they can't get into the EMR. They're not thinking about these new payment behaviors that are going to impact your agency's viability. Somehow that information has to get to the front level clinician. Find a way to share that important information and interpret it and tell them what it means for the viability of the agency. That is critically important. And if I know anything about therapists, particularly physical therapists, we're not a shy retiring type, you know. We have opinions, and we like to know why. And if you can share that information, you know, in a succinct manner, we're on board with it because we're all invested in improving patient outcomes. So where is the intersection of best practices? Well, it's, it's where we can change our, make our 
choices that move us more from a siloed approach to shared responsibility and accountability. So what you measure is what will get managed, right? So if you're measuring certain metrics that don't include therapists, then they're gonna be like feral cats and try to herd that, right? It's not gonna work. So they need to be included in your metrics. You know, we're a high achieving group, okay? We like to be held accountable. We like responsibility, all right? We wanna be part of the decisioning. It's very important to us. We feel like we have a lot to lend to those patient decisions, all right, for care. So it's, it's critically important. And more importantly, we have to look at best practices, okay? So looking at best practices, PTs need to be case managers, period. I mean, you know, enough. This, I don't do windows, I don't do starts of care, my contractors only do this much, enough. Done, over, dead, get gone, I'll free you up for another opportunity, right? I need to find the clinicians that are gonna be part of practicing in this successful payment model, all right? So that we can start to be at the, at the table, we can start to make those decisions. But it's important that we look at some of our state-specific practice guidelines because, like nursing, there's some variations state to state. And so, you know, what are some of the roles that therapists have? What are some of the things that they can and cannot do? So here's an example. This has come up, actually. And so these are just a couple things that you might want to know, and I want to tell you what the APTA in the home health section is doing about this. Is knowing what the PTINR says and the value within the scope of practice for a physical therapist? These questions go to state licensure boards. And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. Medications is a huge issue, because there's a lot of therapists that think that we can't even look at medications. And then I say, you know, but you talk to them about pain meds, don't you? You tell them when to take them. You call the doctor if they're ineffective and they can't participate in therapy. So you either are doing meds or you're not. And it's within our baseline scope of practice since 2004, the CAPTI model for education, pharmacology, okay? Now, we don't do what a pharmacist, a nurse, or a physician does, nor do I want to give or take life-saving meds. That's not my scene. However, we can say, oh, this record on your discharge summary doesn't match what you're taking. I mean, I went to school long enough to see that those don't line up, okay? Another issue, although it's not as relevant now, is this issue about suture removal. That was a big issue way back. Can we take them out? Because we had to get nurses to take them out. And the interpretations and the things that I put here are simply examples. Just to let you know right now, we have a task force through the home health section and the APTA that we are sending to all state practice boards, all right, licensure boards, information this summer, hoping to present before those licensure boards about medications in home care for physical therapy, citing COPs, CMS, our own, our own standards of practice, our education requirements, because how many of you have ever gotten that pushback? I can't do this because I can't handle medications. All right, we all know from reading the OASIS guidance manual, not true, all right, because you can collaborate. So this idea of this, what we consider pushback, is more, I believe, at this point, lack of knowledge of what your own scope of practice is. And so I always tell therapists, just so you know, that if you're practicing, if you are practicing in the comfort zone of your license and not towards the edges of its capability, you're comfortable, you're probably not practicing to the highest level of your license, the full scope of your, of your practice right? And so we need to be expanding that. We need to be holding that expectation for these clinicians. Sounds like I'm down on them, doesn't it? I'm really not. I'm like one of the biggest advocates for PT. But this I don't do windows mentality, I'm so over. All right, so let's look at clinical pillars for CJR. Here they are. You have all the handouts. If you can't, if you can't figure it out by now, I don't like reading from slides. So um, hopefully what I'm saying is making sense and not distracting you from the real information there. Here's the point of what we need to do to operationalize best practices for therapy. 
timely admissions, seven day a week coverage, getting in front of it. Why, if a person goes to skilled nursing or an ERF, do they get daily therapy, but they come home and they get it twice a week? I'm so sorry. Inappropriate if we're the first stop after the hospital for a joint. Every day, right? Get in and get out. We need to be there. Well, my schedule doesn't accommodate it. That's not what I said. That's not patient-centered care. Find a way. Don't go make all those other visits that aren't subacute or acute, right? So we have to start to change the way we schedule, change the way we look at it, and handle these kind of visits where we're getting the therapists out there on a daily basis in the beginning, okay? We need to have the education materials that are patient-centered. Pulling a, a, an existing exercise program out of, your, out of your trunk that's been copied 37 times and is half sideways on the Xerox, the ditto sheet, that then becomes a coloring book for the grandchild or a coffee coaster because it has all these coffee circles on it, is not an individualized, prescriptive, and appropriately dosed exercise program. Enough said there, okay? That's what we need to be doing. We need to be focusing our attention on outcomes, fall reduction. We need to be involved in medication management, reconciliation, review. Let's go with review. We can do DVT monitoring. Did you know that? There's a clinical practice guideline put out by the acute care section of the home health that if you're interested in, you can contact me. Um, that uses the WELLS, right? The WELLS sco scoring. And we should be doing that. It's a clinical practice guideline that acute care therapists use. We should be monitoring that. How many, how many are still saying, I don't do vital signs? My favorite was because I'm intuitive. I can look at the patient. And I said, I'm intuitive. You're getting paid per visit, aren't you? You're in and you're out. OK, <laughs> yeah, OK. That needs to go away. Vital signs are critical. We can do wound care. We can look at surgical wounds. We can teach in signs and symptoms. We have that education to work cooperatively and serve as a clinical manager, especially in some of these select cases that don't need the specialized skills and abilities of a nurse. So let's look at this one. This is one of my last few slides so I can move on to, to Joy and share this time because I could go on forever. Constipation. Whether it's opioid-induced, we know that that's a huge problem sometimes for our patients taking pain medication. Who gets stuck with dealing with constipation? Well, therapists, you know, you think their head will blow off if they walk through the bathroom door, right? We don't do that part, right? We'll take them from the legs on down, but forget this area. Okay, why are we not doing it? Why are we not talking about hydration, dietary interventions, especially with the comorbidity of diabetes? Mobility is a critical component of that. Okay, we should be checking them. Now, do I need to get up there with my stethoscope and hear bowel sounds? Yeah, I don't know about that. But I can ask some basic questions, can I? Did you poop? When's the last time you went to the bathroom? That's a pretty simple one, right? Remember, early identification. So, Here's my resources. The one that was provided um, that if you don't have, that DeJoy is going to get linked on the app is the Medication Management and Physical Therapist. It was, it's a 15-page document. It's got a lot of resources from the APTA. I think you have to be a member to get it, but I've provided it for you. Please read through that. Um, the Role of Physical Therapist in Wound Management. There's the DVT guideline. So if any of you have difficulty accessing these, please feel free. My email is at the end. Um, and then the Wells score, okay? These are things that should be standard skill checklist requirements, basics for post-surgical joints that therapists can go out and admit. Thank you. Oh, questions. I'm done. All right, so once again, thank you all for coming. Um, this is the my title slide and our disclosure statement, which I do not have any conflicts. Um, so just a quick overview. Um, I'm gonna talk about the shift. The shift is kind of the rationale where CMS's intent is going. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the component parts of the shift. We're gonna talk about the market. Um, we're gonna discuss some of the members' best practices that they've shared with us. Uh, we're gonna talk about practice in action. How are these 
How, how are things changing out there already um, as we move towards more bundles and integration? And then we're going to really focus in on the role of integration and some of the commonalities that we found so that you have some takeaways um, to, to go home with and, and to hopefully uh, utilize at home. This is just the triple aim. It's something that, you know, Dee mentioned in her slides, but this is really, this was the focus and this is the change um, to think about the experience of care along with costs and the health of the population instead of looking at them as separate parts, rather looking at them together. And this was the goal that kind of, that IHI put out, that CMS and HHS have held on to and have really been refocusing their intent and their work in. Um, this is my favorite slide that I do have used on a number of occasions, and this is where the market is going, and I think it's, it's very important to continue to remind ourselves about where CMS's focus is moving and where HHS's focus is moving, and in general, where healthcare is moving. You know, um, there once upon a time, everybody was category one, which was fee-for-service, that had no link um, to payment of quality, you know, there, was, there wasn't that linkage where they did quality and payment. And now we are transitioning for fee-for-service with a linkage to quality. Um, we are going more into to category three, which is the alternate payment models that was built on the original fee-for-service archi um, architecture that so many of us are very familiar with. And now we're really moving on to population-based payment. And that is really where um, CMS, regardless of, of change of administration, et cetera, continues to go. Um, and it is something that, you know, we really need to consider um, in the diversification of our services. Just to, to tag in a little bit when we're talking about alternative payment models, um, these things include such as site-neutral payments, looking at bundled payments, um, accountable care organizations, value-based purchasing, whether it's through um, the demonstration such as the HHS VBP, um, there are other uh, post-acute models, there's the hospital model, et cetera, and there continues to be more conversation around what exactly value-based purchasing is and how it applies. Um, there are growing payers. It is not just anymore just your traditional fee-for-service Medicare and Medicaid. There's managed care versions of both of those. There's the growing interest in Medicare Advantage, and it's becoming stronger in every market in each state. Um, there's your private insurance as well as some private payment. I know that that is a small component of most of the business that our members do, but it's something I like to keep in mind as well. Um, and then there's the roles that our agencies play. Are they the provider? Are they the convener? Are they with a larger health system that's been able to convene and to look at all of the different aspects and look at someone in a more holistic way? Are they the individual contractor? Are they a subcontractor? And how are they having that conversation? Um, and then most importantly, when we think about the work um, what is our relationship with risk? You know, we often hear that the convener, there's a level of risk assumed, um, that there is, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to both end up at the, the bottom and the top of the, the um, I'm sorry, of the level. Uh, we see that a lot with our home health value-based uh, uh, value-based purchasing states where they talk about, you know, here's the level of quality and those that are approved above it, they get more than 100% of payment and those who fall below. This relationship with risk is falling um, throughout many categories of payment. It's just not that value-based purchasing. Uh, those who are not at risk who are just flatlined, they're just going to continue to do their traditional fee for service. And then you're starting to see in some of these bundles um, kind of a neutral payment association, but there's retrospective. So it's more of a, a capitated flat, but there's the potential for retrospective perspective payment. Uh, something I did want to highlight for you all, since we are going to talk specifically about some of the bundles, whether they're cardiac or um, the comprehensive joint replacement, there has been some delays, but I do want to keep some dates in front of you uh, so that you are able to anticipate and look at opportunities. Uh, the cardiac bundle has currently been delayed until October 1st of 2017. Um, there will be a list of MSAs provided uh, that will be part of that cardiac bundle. I'm sorry. Apparently popping. Um, and then also the second round of CJR that has grown to include 58 more uh, MSAs. And that is still going forward uh, May 20th of 2017. And more details have been um, appearing on the CMS site. 
Then there's additionally, um, there is, as MACRA continues to roll out, there's the role of the MIPS. Many of you are in the merit incentive-based payments. Um, and then there's the advanced alternative payment models, the AAPMs. Uh, you would note that a lot of um, focus right now about around MACRA has been uh, Secretary Price coming out and saying he wanted uh, more input from physicians. I think this is also an opportunity uh, for those of you who work with physicians to educate them on the role of home-based care. I think it's also an opportunity for us as an organization and then also an industry to just directly let um, Secretary Price know about the important role and the value of home-based care that can be offered. When we look at the market and what the market is doing, when I say market, I'm thinking about more of what the insurance market is doing, what healthcare is doing outside of the strict confines of CMS. Um, there was a, a, an interesting article that came out the other day that said, you know, um, insurance companies and providers are willing to look at these bundles regardless of where CMS is. While CMS is still considering and thinking about it, if you think about it, so much of um, whether it's Medicare Advantage, et cetera, is able to continue to move forward and think about how they want to lay out um, the work that's being done. They're, they're looking for voluntary involvement in these value-based initiatives. Um, they are looking at evidence-based solutions, so it's so, so important for you to know your value, your quality that you bring. Where are you on readmissions? What is your best protocols, et cetera? Um, and really the role that home-based care brings. We are high quality. Um, we are less expensive than the institutional care in many settings. Um, and we are accountable, and how do, we, how do we get that picture, and how do we project that value um, to a larger growing uh, number of people, and refers, most importantly. Um, some of the downside, which is why they're red, is unfortunately there's no, while there is the Impact Act, there's, when it comes to some of these voluntary involvement, there is not an industry wide requirement for standards and quality. A lot of them get to create their own uh, quality reporting metrics, and standardizations. And I think that's something that's been very um, frustrating and daunting when you have a number of different metrics, when you have a number of different payers that you have to report on different information. So I think it's important that in the early end of the conversations to get out there and to help formulate some of those um, quality measurements and where you want to be a part and be at that solution. Um, you know, this is. Uh, the more I talk to our membership, the more I know that you are care coordinators. You, you, you know, you own that space. Uh, you're great at med reconciliation. These are all um, areas where a lot of these payers are looking for solutions and putting forward that value and that opportunity and being that solution is going to be a very important part of the conversation. Uh, Changing behaviors, it's a, it's a lift, I, I, I won't lie. Um, there is, you know, I had a, a great conversation uh, at the CEO breakfast about changing those behaviors and getting referral patterns to change and then just also the education of whether it's ED departments or um, ortho phys physicians, et cetera, for them to understand it's okay to go home, that the quality is there, that the scope of the work that can be done in the home so that that we can get beyond and fully grasp the level of professionalism and the licensure and the scope of practice that can be um, completed and done in a home in a high quality at, at equal or greater outcomes um, for less, for less. We must underline that part. And then the role of home-based care. Again, it's that education, it's that outreach, um, and it's that sharing with everyone so that they understand truly what's able to be done. So when I talk to a variety of our members about what it is that they do in bundles that have been so successful, and I spoke with many, especially around CJR, because it is of such interest and growth, um, they truly develop a system protocol. And that protocol is formulated with the, the orthopedic departments, that it's something that is carried on, whether it's the nurses going into the home, whether it's the, the PT who's going into the home, whether it's the, the orthopedic folks, it's the ED. There's a central record, which is very important, that, that electronic medical record that allows for everyone to be involved and accountable. But there is a standardization. now. Don't get me wrong, every individual does need their protocol. I'm not, I'm not recommending the sheet that's Xerox sideways with the coffee rings on it by any approach. But 
having that conversation and developing that protocol with the orthopedic surgeon and the PT department is going to allow them to understand the level of professionality and also the level of compliance so that they understand that this is something you're going to reiterate and make sure that the patient is doing. Um, that electronic medical record is going to keep everyone involved and accountable. Um, it's going to be a better way to reach out. There's, I know that is harder for those of you who are not within an integrated system, but it is so important to allow this, this stream of communication and this, this stream of information. Um, the interdisciplinary team approach, there's an equality of voices. It's not just what the physician says, it's the respect that's given to the, the physicians, the PTs, the nurses who go into the home and are seeing with their own eyes the level of compliance, um, the level of need, and are able to highlight early and be more proactive about any um, concerns or issues. Uh, and then the, the most interesting part I found was the pre-surgical visits are worth the cost. Um, it is not always included in the CJR that, that um, the home care nurse would go out in advance and look at the condition that the per person is returning back into the home with, but it is very important to understand the environment and any potential um, pitfalls that may exist. The, the steps you didn't know about, the throw rugs that you didn't know about, um, and is there a level of support and safety that's available at home so that you can truly have patients that are actually going to be compliant and safe in their homes. So just wanted to, to give you a couple of, um, I mentioned it before in a conversation about the advisory board report that talked about um, the CGR bundles, that they did a report with some of their membership and then have shared it about what is causing doctors to change their referral habits. It's the fact they're on the hook, that they have skin in the game, that there is, there is a set amount of money that they are now at risk for, and almost 70% have changed their referral habits. They are Dutch doing much more referrals to home. Uh, they're seeing great outcomes of equal or better uh, measures. And I think that is one of those things that, so the shift can happen, it can occur. We're about a year into the CJR bundle, so there is actual movement. Um, I'm happy to share a link to that report. I, I found that and I thought that was absolutely great. And then also um, from our, the, our friends at the Alliance, they did put, um, they did study CJR MSAs and look at um, different outcomes they had. It was before the bundles were fully wrapped in, but just looking at their discharge. Uh, for home health, we're getting equal or better patient outcomes and mobility and pain levels. There's a significant provider savings of approximately $5,000 per episode. So if you think about the number of folks that are doing hips and knees and shoulders, et cetera, if $5,000 per episode, that is a tremendous amount of money that's available on the table. And then these were when I said, what makes integration happen? What are the things that you need in to truly be able to coordinate together. The, the answers were technology, which would include those electronic medical records, coordination, that would include the conversations back and forth, um, you know, the, the role that we all play in this situation, the diversification of patients and payers. They said that's actually extremely important because you can't be beholden to one payer and one model if you want to be able to grow and sustain. Um, the ability to accept risk, and frankly, a seat at the table. They said, this is what is most important to us when it comes to the role of integration. So with that, I'm going to go to questions for Dee and myself. Um, can we take any questions? Do you want to share something? No, I'm good. Okay. Our, if there's nothing, I can let you go. I do want to make sure that you all um, signed in on the sheet for those of you who need the record. It's right up there. Did everyone get that? If not, it's at the uh, round table by the projector so that you all get your CEUs. Um, I will remind you that within the app is the survey that allows you to take the survey and get the credit for that. Um, and uh, Dee's informa uh, contact information is within her slides and then mine is also on the app as well if you need anything. So thank you very much. We're happy to talk with you after. Thank you. Thank you.